Oh, there's no light. Okay. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting for Thursday, June 19th, 2014. Can I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bewley. Here. Mr. Chiazzo. Here. Mrs. Lang. Here. Uh, Mrs. Massengill. Mrs. Murphy. Here. Ms. Perry. Here. Mrs. Shea. Here. Ms. Agar. Ms. Murray. Okay, you join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So this is technically a workshop meeting, but we do have a small business agenda. Uh, first, uh, 5.1 minutes of May 8, 2014, with revisions. Move approval and revise. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Six. And 5.2 appointments. Um, these are some appointments they have. Um, what I'm recommending, um, uh, and let me go through them. Uh, first, a uh, special education teacher, um, uh, Treya Plummer, is nominated to fill a position created by resignation. Um, Ms. Plummer received her undergraduate degree from the University of Southern Maine, master's in special education from New England College. Uh, she's been in ed tech for the last, uh, ed tech three, for the past 11 years. Um, in uh, a special education classroom at Wentworth. So um, this is someone that knows us very well and we know her very well. Um, my <coughs> recommendation is to appoint uh, Tria Plummer as a special education teacher. Move approval. Second. Okay, all in favor of approving? Tria. Thank uh, you. Second is um, another special education teacher. This is Katrina Edwards. Uh, she's nominated to fill uh, this position that has been created by a retirement. Ms. Edwards is a graduate from Mary Washington College and jo George Mason University. She's been teaching in a classroom setting for 11 years, most recently as a special ed teacher in Cape Elizabeth, RSU 23 and Spurwink. Uh, the recommendation is to appoint Katrina Edwards um, as a special education teacher with us. Move approval. Second. Okay, all in favor of approving Katrina Edwards, special ed teacher. The third is um, a classroom teacher uh, at Eight Corners. Uh, this is Sarah Galino. Um, uh, am I saying that right? I'm Giuliano. 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 Giuliano? Okay. Sarah Giuliano, uh, nominated to fill this position created by a retirement. Uh, Ms. Giuliano is a graduate from the University of New England, uh, BS in uh, elementary ed, and this past year she's been an ed tech at the Eight Corners School, uh, and where she also completed her student teaching requirements. The recommendation is to appoint uh, Sarah uh, Giuliano as a classroom teacher to the Eight Corners School. Move approval. Second. All in favor of approving Sarah Giuliano. Thank you. Um, the next is um, high school Spanish teacher. This is Riva <laughs> Riva Eiferman, um, Eiferman uh, nominated to fill this position that's created by a resignation. Ms. Eiferman gra uh, graduated undergraduate from Colby, completed uh, the, ex the um, ETEP program through USM. She's been a student teacher at both Gorm and Wyndham High School. Delighted to um, recommend. Ms. Eiferman uh, to uh, be appointed as a high school Spanish teacher. Second. All in favor of approving Eiferman? She's also a fluent Spanish speaker. Great. And a very highly energized teacher. Um, uh, all of these folks have, have been very impressive. Next is a high school math teacher. You can see that David's been busy. Um, Jennifer Wood is nominated to fill this position created by resignation. Ms. Wood received her degree in secondary ed and mathematics from the University of Maine. She's been student teaching. She's been student teaching in the Brewer Community School and Brewer High School, 
and um, she is also a graduate of Scarborough High School. Um, my recommendation is to appoint Jennifer Wood as high school math teacher. Move approval. Second. All in favor of Jennifer Wood? Great. It's a nice mixture of experience and new teachers. There's some really good energy happening up there. Last is um, another high school math teacher. Uh, this is Christopher Haywood. He is nominated to fill this position that was created by a resignation. Mr. Haywood earned his undergraduate degree in math from the University of Maine, um, master's from University of New Hampshire. He's been teaching high school math since 89 in Presque Isle, Freeport, most recently in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and he was a, a teacher here at Scarborough High School. Uh, Mr. Haywood uh, will be, uh, okay, uh, my recommendation is to appoint Christopher Haywood, um, and we're excited to, to get Christopher back to um, Scarborough as a high school math teacher. Second. All in favor of Chris Hayward? Six. There we go. Okay, so 5.3, Feinberg Arts Trust. Um, I believe that you received um, a bit of a write-up on this. All I have to do is find it. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay, yes. Um, as you know, um, <coughs> uh, Louis Feinberg uh, is a, a, someone who was a long-term resident of Scarborough. He actually generously left a gift of $100,000, um, which supports both the uh, backpack program um, and um, it is, uh, provides seed money for 10 years uh, to the Scarborough Education Foundation. We were told that uh, he has uh, left us an additional gift. Um, this is in the amount of $150,000. Uh, Jeff Jones, his attorney, um, advised us of that. Uh, the gift is specifically intended to support arts education and enrichment for Scarborough students. Um, and in anticipation of the gift, we did start up a Scarborough Schools Arts Council. Um, I asked uh, Sue Ketch, who is very connected uh, to the arts, to help me with that, and we reached out to community members um, that w had different connections to the arts. We've had now two meetings uh, with them as we've tried to um, create a direction for what this trust would actually provide for. The Scarborough Arts Council has brainstormed many ideas for projects or initiatives. Um, one of the things that they're really excited about thinking about bringing back in, in probably in a reinvented way is the um, Scarborough School Art Show, mm -hmm. which I know that I heard about when I first started here and spoke with dozens and dozens of people. That was on uh, lots of people's minds. So um, there's some thinking about how do we do that in a different way that makes that um, art show sustainable and also has a community connection. For example, it could be happening at Piper Shores instead of here. And, and so there's all, all sorts of interesting um, iterations on that. So we, um, th the, the intent is to use that money to seed arts initiatives. One of the other things that we're looking at is the model that Gorham has. They have a Gorham Arts Council, I think, or Gorham Arts what is it? Alliance. Alliance. Um, and we've been trying to get uh, some some of their folks to come and speak with us. We had someone from the um, main uh, the, the main arts commission come and speak with us at our last meeting. Anyway, so there's a lot of exciting energy about it. Um, it and uh, this summer we'll take the uh, the materials that have been brainstormed, the ideas in terms of projects and initiatives. Um, will be more fully uh, developed and brought back to that art council. We'll probably pick something that's relatively easy to do and then something that's a bigger, longer-term project. Um, and, and we'll keep you advised as we go. So what we're looking for tonight is a motion um, to uh, approve acceptance of that um, money from Mr. Um, Feinberg and add it to the Feinberg Trust. This would be segregated as being the, the arts part of the trust, that 150,000 separated from the other 100,000 or whatever the balance is, it's still pretty, pretty much up there, um, that sits in the overall trust uh, that we have. And it's uh, both uh, Louis and Tina, Tina uh, who is his, his wife, who is also deceased, um, Feinberg Trust. So that's what we're looking for. Approval. Second. 
All in favor of accepting this gift? Thanks. And which is very, very, Wonderful. very appreciative. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Have anything to say? Yeah, go ahead. So um, I, I'm not sure, but I believe I met Mr. Feinberg. Um, I think he might have been down at um, Scarborough Terrace for a while. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And um, after he had given the first amount, I happened to be at an event there um, through Project Grace, and you might have met him too. Yeah, I did. Just a delightful man. Mm -hmm. He's just so excited about supporting the schools. And um, he told me that he had owned a piano uh, store on Congress Street for many, many years. And um, you know, down near where the, uh, the college is now, Main College of Art. And um, he was just a joy to talk to. It was just a pleasure. And for him to leave, this is just really wonderful. I'm a huge supporter of the arts. I think it's really important in kids' education and has huge implications for math and, and science and, and English. And I, I'm just really, really thrilled that we would be gifted with such a wonderful mm -hmm. opportunity here to, to use this money in a really meaningful way for improving the arts, which I feel is lacking in this district. Mm -hmm. That's great, because I know um, even just on a micro level, my kids are old enough that they had stuff in the art show. They're, my older girls were very young when they did, but um, every kid in there was super proud to have something hanging on the wall. So to walk through and to find their thing and show it off, and you could see the parents taking a picture with the kid next to it and taking pictures of their friend's artwork. I mean, it's a big deal. To, and school, that might be their favorite class, and to have some recognition for it, I think it's pretty amazing. So um, I hope that is a return, the art show does come back because it is very um, important to kids to see that they're recognized in all areas of their their successes. So, thank you. Now, on to the workshop session. Just a, just a note on the Feinberg Trust. Um, it's also my understanding that uh, <coughs> Louis Feinberg um, left, uh, ultimately left to the schools some of his instruments. And, oh, really? Um, and I think that um, that's that's still not completely firmed up. But in the event that that is the case, um, we would be doing some special recognition um, and, and and some uh, small exhibit of those um, of, of those instruments. Hmm. Okay. And, and some way to um, recognize them in, in any other opportunities that we have, whether it's the. Feinberg Art Show or, you know, yeah. high school Feinberg right. Art Show, whatever, um, anything to advance that and also to, that we make sure that a letter goes to the family by way of the lawyer to his children. So whoever wants to do that. We, we are taking yep. care of that. Okay. Yep. Jack, before we move on, uh, th before we had the <coughs> meeting, we discussed some of us received letters from members of the K kids at at the Wentworth School. And the K kids, uh, you, you may have noticed it's a Kiwanis logo. K kids is a program of Kiwanis uh, to help children uh, become more aware of their community and do community service. And these children do a lot of community service. And their advisor, is Mary Griffin, who is a guidance counselor at Wentworth, and their mentor for the last several years has been Laura Buston, who's a member of Kiwanis and is the manager of the Saco Biddeford Savings. And I had an email from Bob Mitchell, uh, and he sent me copies of the letters that uh, he and Rebecca received, and thanking me uh, as a Kiwanian, and I wrote back and I said, well, Kiwanis really had nothing to do with it. It was an initiative, evidently, from the club. So uh, I thought it was only for uh, the, the committee on the school, but they're thanking everybody, I guess, for the new Wentworth. Yeah. And uh, I want to thank Mary Griffin and, and the members of the K-Kids for recognizing the contribution that some of the citizens in town are making. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended the um, 
the last assembly at, oh. at Wentworth, and they read they read some of those letters to the community. Did you read them? I've, I've gotten one, so I, <laughs> I've read them and I've heard them. So <laughs> that was very sweet. It was very touching. Very nice of them to think of of how can we thank the community personally. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. I, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I also received a letter, but there was no return address and no way to respond. I'm right. wondering if there's an opportunity maybe to invite them to one of our meetings just to give them a little acknowledgement. I mean, I know that that's not, um, you know, it would be just nice to be able to say thank you some way just to... Um, the club, you mean the yeah, small group? Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's, there's really no way to respond to, uh, you know, just to say thank you for your thoughts and it was yeah. very, very... Very pleasant surprise. Yeah. Usually, yeah. usually when we get letters <laughs> in the mail, yeah. they're not always positive. So it was, it was <laughs> nice, uh, nice to see that. Uh -huh. so. and Kelly, before we move on, are you going to mention about the tour of the new school that we had on Monday evening? I think you I could, could talk you. about that all night. Jeff. I know, but <laughs> outside. Of you. Okay, it was fantastic. The building committee was given the opportunity to go into the new Wentworth School on Monday. Um, also, um, town councilors were invited and. Um, Tom Hall, the town manager, was there, and it was amazing. I mean, it really was so spectacular to see um, <clears throat> building committee members. Actually, we were led by, um, we split up into two groups, Bill LeClaire, the owner's rep, or uh, with Todd Jepson, the facilities manager, to lead us through the building. But we all know the plans, so we knew where we were. <laughs> we were all like, oh, no, that's the art room. We know where that is. And, <laughs> I mean, how many hours have we all stared at the at the floor plans of that school? So, yeah, a lot, a lot of years, and um, so it was very fun to see it all laid out there. I was also on the interiors committee, so all the colors that we picked look really good now that they're on the floors and on the walls and on the lockers. Um, it's really just going to be an amazing place for kids for learning and for the community to have. Um, meetings and groups just to get together. There's so many spaces in that building that are so available um, and ideally suited for community groups. I mean, from the Learning Commons, which would be what you would call the library, has several meeting areas that can happen simultaneously. There's even a little wet kitchen area, so you could do arts and crafts for a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout troop or a cooking class. Or Possibilities are endless. And then in the cafeteria, there's a small little kitchen space for groups that could bring in their own food and um, have meetings in there. And I mean, just an incredible asset for this town. Between the gym that we, I'm sure, will have full every single second of the day will be full and into the night. And I'm sure we could use that even as a revenue generation because it's just a beautiful gym with a lot of daylight space and 400 seat bleachers. Um, and then to have that with a stage in it, to have performances there, and even opens up onto the cafeteria side. I mean, the possibilities are really endless, and it's going to be an amazing place for kids to learn. And as I said that night, it's going to be hard for kids to fail there because it's so equipped for kids to learn and for teachers to teach more easily. So it's, I can't wait for everyone to see it when it opens in the fall. We don't know. Well, there's a lot of action. There's a lot of get the school board in there. There's a lot of action happening in there this summer. Um, with they're putting together all the furniture and they're hooking up all the electronics. So they're, I think, using every second they have until school opens. But that would be awesome if we could go back in there and get another peek. But um, you might be able to arrange. Something. We yeah. won't disturb anybody. We promise. Yeah. Yeah. I, People have been asking me if I've been in yet. Well, the teachers got to go in. The Wentworth teachers got yeah. to go in on we Tuesday morning, and I heard reports that teachers were literally crying they were emotional. They uh, because it was emotional. such. It's such a change from the old building. Sure. It's so. It's it so. Night and day. Absolutely night. night and day. I mean, it really <laughs> is incredible, and to see it after four years of just. Let's have a building committee. Let's try again to see it yeah. actually built is incredible, and I thank this town for passing it this time. Christine okay. Koch was on the building committee and and went through, and as you know, Christine has retired this year. And I went up. I said, "You sure you want to leave? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is not be the year to retire." And they've already shut the electricity off at Wentworth, and they're, they're getting started. They're starting Monday on a demolition. Okay. 
there are pictures posted on Facebook um, on the Support a New Wentworth School Facebook page, but also on there there is a link to a Shutterfly album. So if you don't have Facebook, find someone who does and they can email you that link. Um, so you can see there's probably 75 or 80 pictures, so mm -hmm. even more than that on the on the Facebook site, but um, check them out. It's pretty impressive. There are benches from Elsa the Tree. Elsa there the are tree. benches that were created with that tree that was what, two, over 200 years old. It was taken down in Oak Hill yeah. a few years ago, so uh, yeah. CPM constructors donated those benches, and they're beautiful. They are very nice. <laughs> so thank you to everyone who helped on this building. Well, well served to the community. It's going to be great. Thank you. I, I just thought that people should have a little bit of an update on that. It's just an incredible space. So is our first goal going to be to get the school board in Wentworth School? We can, uh, Kelly and I can <laughs> uh, arrange something. We'll add that right to our goals and objectives. It, it, may, um, it, it may be a week out or so, but I think we might be able to do that. Great. We'll, um, we'll twist Todd's arm. Sounds good to me. All right, on to 6.0. So this is the workshop uh, session. Uh, I thought that, you know, we're, we're um, bringing to a close another school year, and it seems like it's a, a good time to just um, have an opportunity to reflect on the board goals for this year, um, not necessarily to set the goals for next year, but to really reflect on what likely is going to be continued um, work and, um, and uh, where there might be some open space to take on some, some new initiatives. Uh, and this will be a conversation that uh, we can continue on to the, um, to the board retreat later in the summer. So I don't know if you want to... I don't know. That, I, yeah, so um, I guess we could just review our goals and talk about if we... I mean, it's the workshop, so anyone just jump in. Um, our goals, these were actually set in August, so Jane and Jody, you weren't with us at that point, but I think you've seen them before, mm -hmm. the goals. Um, so goal one was work with and evaluate the superintendent. I think we've done that, and we're in the midst of evaluating right now. So. And we are going into executive session Correct. after this. Correct. So. But say we're Keep going. doing a great job on that one. Goal two, serve as advocates for all children, teachers, and other staff by adopting Kids First goals, policies, and budgets. And then there's some targets listed here to continue to secure resources and provide support to the leadership council and schools slash departments for successful implementation of the 18-month improvement strategy. B, policy subcommittee objectives. Continue to fully educate all school board members and the public to the extent possible about the purpose of policy development. Complete a full strategic review of current policies and work to eliminate non-essential policies, revise outdated policies, and ensure inclusion of all required policies. And C, monitor and support the transition to the new Wentworth School. So C, hey, right on. Um, B, the policy subcommittee. Mm -hmm. We're working, we're getting through it. It's, there's a lot of non-required and non-mandated non-recommended policies, we're working our way through. Those are and trickier how, than the others. How far do you, th with regards to your progress, would you say you're a quarter of the way through, halfway through? It's hard to tell because they're online. I mean, we don't have the stack of papers in front of us, so I don't, I don't know, Kelly, if you have an idea. I don't. It's hard to, I, I don't really have a gauge on that. We okay. just you take it like a three or four at a meeting and just sort of work through those. So yeah, continuing, so. <laughs> continuing progress, I think, is the best way to put it. As anything new comes out from the l legal offices, we, we react <coughs> to those. You have put, to putting jump those on those. In front yeah. of the ones yeah. that we mm -hmm. had planned on, and I think it's just something that's it's going to go on forever. It's ongoing. <laughs> it, it, it never ends, I know no, that. Yeah. But as far as the process that was initiated three years ago. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't really have a gauge. We've handled all the required and the recommended. Um, you know, those obviously keep, changes keep coming up, okay. but I don't really have a good handle on how many others there okay, are. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so we'll just keep working through as 
give you a D on that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll put it. Would that be D. developing or a D D? <laughs> developing. Okay, good. That's the new D. Yeah, the new D. Okay, good. And I just to just to speak about the um, continuing to secure resources and advocate uh, for the resources needed. I, I think that I speak on behalf of the leadership council and say that you know uh, we are delighted with the the board's work um, as advocates for resources um, and uh, and the tenacity with which you um, approach that responsibility. It's it's critically important as we see and and um, if we if we were not sort of pushing and and advocating, we would we would be in a very different position, and that would be very unfortunate. So we're in, uh, I, I think, I, I put an arrow to say that that's probably something that will, that you'd probably want to keep focused on, okay. um, but certainly I, I think that uh, we would give um, a P on that. P? Yes, Passive. proficient. Oh. <laughs> no, elementary school, that would be an S. S, strong. Strong. We would give strong. strong. Okay. I, we're going to grade ourselves on that one. A strong. Is strong. Okay. okay. Well, I, th I think we also have to, and as we move down to the next one as well, we've got to find some new strategies. Absolutely. We really do. So goal three, maintain fiscal responsibility and fiscal autonomy with the authority to appropriate local funds necessary to support the board approved budget. And we have some targets there. The budget subcommittee objectives. Continue to refine the budget process to a two-year projection period, first year being detailed and second year being more of a high level with quarterly updates throughout the year. Work closely with the Long Range School Facilities Plan Subcommittee to ensure financial integration with the operating budgets and the long-term financial needs of the school. Continue to work with the Leadership Council and especially with the Facilities Manager, Building Committee, and Architects to produce weekly and monthly summary financial status reports on the financial progress relative to the budget of the new Wentworth School. Continue to provide budget-related information to key stakeholders via conversations and updates on a routine basis. Um, and B, Long-Range School Facilities Plan Subcommittee Objectives. Conduct data analysis and facility adequacy assessments that will lead to development of a comprehensive long-range school facilities plan. And C, negotiation subcommittee objectives. Annually submit to the board expiration dates on all contracts. Project the start of negotiations for expiring contracts and set date for board review. Solicit input from school leaders related to either new or revised language that will enhance our collective ability to achieve teaching and learning goals in every school. During negotiations and within four days of each meeting, the school assigned negotiation team member will produce and distribute a summary of the meeting, new, revised language, tentative agreements, discussion points, and information needed for the next meeting and who will gather the information. The negotiating committee will create and or consult relevant labor market data for purposes of wage and benefit comparisons. The committee will develop for board review a competitive target salary philosophy with suggested benefits for a total competitive package. The board will decide the financial parameters. Significant proposed changes will be reviewed by legal counsel early in the process to expedite negotiations. The committee will review the leadership with the leadership counsel and the board the incentive language for compensation. As the law will allow, the board will seek more cost-effective means of providing health benefits. So, a lot of moving parts in this one. Um, I think you're absolutely right, Jackie, with the budget. We need to do something different. I don't know what it is. Well, this the third bullet under A, uh, the, the new Wentworth is, is completed, mm -hmm. uh, will be completed when, when we start uh, setting new goals. But the important piece for me in, in this first couple of sections is the long range mm -hmm. facility subcommittee mm -hmm. because I know, we know, that we're going to have to deal with the middle school fairly soon. Uh, and I don't know if there's anything m major coming down the pike for K2, but y you know, we've known over the last four or five years that the middle school is going to need some work. So. Uh, I'm sure that will come out uh, as they 
move forward. As far as negotiations are concerned, it's difficult sometimes to meet our target. Mm. Um, my major concern in negotiations is that our employees continue to be the brunt of the budget. And they are, uh, we know that it's been difficult to maintain a competitive wage mm. at all, with all contracts. I mean, it is just very difficult to do that. And it is disheartening sometimes to know how well our people are performing and that we're so fortunate that they stay with us, mm -hmm. given the fact that pay in surrounding communities is in some instances dramatically higher. So I think as long as we can keep our students at the level that they are and, and keep it a pleasant place to teach and sometimes actually fun to be with our students, that they know that they have the support of central office administration of the board. That's our biggest task right now because there's no money to throw into the pot. And I think that that is uh, not what people think looking from the outside in. Yeah, I know. They think that we are spending too much on salaries yeah, and benefits and they're out of control. But if you look at surrounding communities and we look at the number of teachers we have, we are Smack in the middle, if not lower than most. So. Oh, lower. Yeah. Well. Just yeah. one. Ex just one example, and I think that some of you have heard mm -hmm. this, but it bears repeating. If you look at the top ten schools, high schools, in the state, we came in number ten. The Academy of um, of Math and Science <coughs> has a student to teacher ratio that is so tight and so small that you can't even count it. But if you look at the other eight, and then you would see that the ratio is one teacher for every 11.6 students. We have one teacher for every 15 students. Now that 11.6 and 15 doesn't seem real big, but if you extrapolate and push that forward, David would actually have 20 more faculty members, full-time faculty members at that high school if, in fact, we were consistent with the other eight who were in the top ten. That's just one example, one example. of, and, and the, at the cost of approximately $1.3 million, an additional $1.3 million for 20 extra teachers. With far fewer students. Pardon me? With far fewer students in those towns. Right, but, the, but it's a student, it's a, it's a ratio, it's a teacher ratio. student okay. ratio. <laughs> So if we went to an 11.6 or, or 1 to 12, mm -hmm. um, we would have 20 more uh, full-time equivalent teachers in the high school. Just that it's deceiving, I think, for the public because they think that is a teacher and 12 kids right, right. throughout the district. Right. And that's yeah. inaccurate. Right. Yeah. So it, it's not that at all. Yeah. I, I think from a financial perspective, one of the things that I've I've become more painfully aware of, I guess, for lack of a better word, is we're really dealing with two different audiences. The conversation we have with the council has to be on a different level than the conversation we have with the public. And the reason I say that is because I think the council, we can go through, we have more opportunities and more time to go through the process with them and explain some of the details. There's more of an, of an interaction kind of thing. I think when we're looking for issues to try and cut, we, we can't go through and do our budget planning, you know, where we do the first year really detailed and the second year overview because we have people now that want the details and everything. And what happens is when we we get distracted and off message having to deal with the the um, inaccurate information that's out there. So instead of us talking about things like teacher ratios and, mm -hmm. and student teacher ratios and, and and comps for us in other districts, we find ourselves defending our position versus inaccurate information that's not realistic, that's completely, you know, non-founded non anything. So we've, I, I think part of our strategy really needs to be finding a way to parse that out and, and, and working with the council to get them um, almost to, to a certain extent try and act as advocates for us because at the end of the day, I think if we can help them understand things to a greater detail, 
at a minimum, if they're not going to advocate, at least not oppose. Mm -hmm. you know. Or at least not give inaccurate information right. at meetings that we can't respond to right. when, when we're, we're tied because we, we can't give the answer. Right. Um, but And I think, <coughs> I guess I'd like to see more full board, full council present for some discussions that just the finance committees, although you'll still have to do your job, um, it is apparently not enough to inform the full council. Well, so, you know, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, it's all right. Go ahead. Several years ago, just prior to when the library was built, do you recall when that was? Oh, God. I know. Uh, Doesn't matter. Late 80s, 80s, I think. Pardon me? 80s, late 80s, 80s, I think. Well, prior to that, uh, we had somebody come in to act as a facilitator, somebody from, from uh, I think it was United Way. And the council and the board sat down, and all of the administrators from both sides were in the room. And we talked about the needs of, of the town. And that's when it was determined that the library was going to be the next structure that was going to be built in this town. And we talked about many things, about school needs and the town needs, public safety needs, uh, and uh, we met three or four different times uh, as one huge group and just talked. But we had a facilitator who, uh, who had nothing to do with mm -hmm. either side of the mm -hmm. table, so to speak, to keep people on task. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was very productive. But I like to work that way, so maybe other people didn't feel it was as productive as I did. But at least it got everything on the table that was on everybody's mind, mm -hmm. whether you were a school board person or you were a counselor. And in instances, the town manager might ask the public works director, you, you, do you agree with that mm -hmm. type of thing? Not that they would doubt the, a counselor's opinion, but they had the experts around us yeah. to assist with the data. So. Chris, that might be something that we might want, and George, we might want to suggest. Mm. Maybe someone like going Kevin forward. Freeman might be. A Pardon good, me? Kevin Freeman might be a good person to be able to facilitate. Something well, as like I say, I'm not, I'm not picking that, out any, but any one person. I'm huh. just saying that it was effective once. I think that, um, I, I think that's a great idea, I, and I think that it's going to take something like that to get us focused on what is in the best interest of uh, and what what needs to be done in this town in the best interest of the town all, all members all including members. including uh -huh. the students and I in, in some ways I think that we're too quick to say it's good enough um, when we know it's really it, it could be much better yeah um, I, I think there's I think there's an opportunity I know I've captured going just going through the the uh, budget process this year and then reflecting on um, things that sort of worked well and other things that didn't work well. Um, I have a whole list of things that we might think about doing differently. For example, I don't know why we need to be presenting a budget out of the gate when in fact I don't know what kind of state money I have and I don't know what my biggest cost factor is, which is health care costs. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. It's it's. You know, it basically sets us up to, in order to be, um, in order to be appropriate in terms of, of putting together a projection, it ends up naturally being high, and people are like, oh, it's like it's it's gigantic. Well, if you don't want to hear gigantic, then let's let's get the subsidy number and let's get the the um, increase in terms of, of benefits. And, and go from there, you know. And so, I mean, just that one, that just that one pause button on running out the gate and getting a number, which, quite frankly, we don't do much with. 
until, as you see, it's, it's really in the 11th hour that things get, get moved. And so I, I think it's a little bit too premature, and it doesn't set us up in good stead. No, it sets um, us up very poorly. Mm. So I, th I think th so. There are there are there are logistical things that we can do, and I think that there are conversational dialogue pieces that need to ha to happen as well. And and I know that Tom um, has been uh, chatting with uh, Kate and with me, and uh, and I, I had a little chat with him. And you. Yeah. Um, it really it looking forward to how, how are we going to sort of reset this um, this conversation in a way that, that can be very productive and and, um, and 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 efficient. You know, it's it's inefficient really the way that it happens. Well, and, and the other thing is, we sometimes we're getting better at it, but we sometimes all of us use the educational jargon that nobody understands. You know, they'll say, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, just like the learning commons. commons. Learning commons. So what the, the learning commons? <laughs> oh, library. It's library. a library. Well, then, John, let's call it a library. <laughs> Most people know it as a li You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. The yeah. average person out there in Scarborough, Maine, has no clue what a learning commons is. And I have a master's degree in English. I had no idea what a learning commons is. Yeah. I do now because Kelly told me. Yeah. Well, Kelly can't tell everybody. No, I'll don't. tell everyone right now. A learning commons <laughs> is more than just a library. <laughs> yes. It's a gathering space to learn using computers, and there's a little reading theater where it can happen with presentations. I think, I think what's beyond a library. I think what Jackie's saying is. When you say library, people sort of get the idea. It's yeah. quick, it's easy, people get it. Whereas right. you just started in on the, it's more than a library, it's a, and then you've lost it. <coughs> well, if, if you saw a kitchen in a library, you'd be confused. Yeah. Right. But I think, I think but there's that a kitchen in the there's learning a, commons. <laughs> there's a point to that, though. And I think the point of that is, and, we, and you know, we've had this discussion internally a few times where we said, so what? You know, we go around and we, we talk about, well, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. So what? What does that mean? What, what, how, do you, how do we simplify it in a way that we can communicate it properly? And, and I think, you know, it's all about communication, both with the board and both with the community. And I think, you know, the reason we have the process that we have in place, you know, it, I, I'm assuming comes from a, a, a state in the past where there wasn't a lot of trust. So there's a lot of, of back and forth of, well, I'm here, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, negotiating, for lack of a better word. <coughs> and I think if we can open the communication a little bit better and, and have an understanding of each other's needs and, and, and come to the realization that, okay, you know, we do have to make tough decisions collectively for the town, and, and, let's, and let's work together to find out what those are, and then we can, we can work on delivering that working that into what our needs are and presenting it to the council in a way that, that doesn't necessarily make them immediately go, what the heck is that? You know? Well, let me give you a little example. Because when I first looked at the budget, I said, mm, the social worker piece. That's just a, a little, little piece that could have been solved by us mm -hmm. right at the beginning by saying, we have reallocated the resources. The bottom line is still the same, but we are now costing it out differently and, and have a, some sort of a sheet or something that explains it. That's just one piece. Yeah. And we get so involved and we're so darn busy, not only with the budget, but with everything else that's going around. We understand it, and that's what I'm saying. We don't make it clear. Right. Well, and then when we get to the last second reading on the darn budget, and somebody brings it up, and somebody else brings it up, and we're trying to put out the fire, they don't hear it. Right. 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 Well, so that's what I'm saying. We've got to be <laughs> a little more proactive. We've got to do all of us. I'm not saying it's just the budget committee and the superintendent right. and the... All of us have a responsibility. Well, it's, it's not even just the, the particulars of the budget. It's that this is the town's budget. It's mm -hmm. not the teams of 
if we spend it here, then we're taking away from the teams over here. It's all one budget. It's all part of the one municipal budget. So I think that somehow needs to fall away. I don't know what we do over the course of this year, but there has to be some way that people start to come to the understanding that, yes, this is the only part of the budget that's voted on. It's not fair. And people would like to have the opportunity to vote and speak about other parts of the budget, which I don't disagree with. But the point is, this is all we've got, and we need to have some way that we can get a message out to people that don't take it out on the schools right, because bad. it's the only thing you have a ballot for. So, But I think it's difficult. very, very important for us to coordinate those efforts with the council because the, you know, the frustration that I faced this, this cycle was spending months and months and months. Yes, we started with a, high, uh, a, a higher initial budget because, quite frankly, we're looking at trying to play catch up and that's a realistic number and you're trying to put things <laughs> into perspective. So there is, it's not, you know, there are, there's a reason behind everything, and, and the reasons aren't always clear for sure. But to spend four months on a process, a very intensive process, and then at the last minute have it come down to seven people who decide arbitrarily that, you know what, I think it should be this, that's really not effective. So, the, you know, the, really the way to, to work out and get what we need a, as efficiently as possible is to look at the people that we have to you know, first rule of sales, identify the decision makers. So we've got to sit down with those people and, and, and as you said, Kelly, you know, start with that process to say, it's not us and you. It's not even we and them. It's, it's all of us. So, you know, if you're going to tell us that this year, you know, I, we've already heard, next year is going to be more of the same. You know, and if you look back statistically, it's never been a good time for a budget. It never will be a good time for a budget in this town. But we have to philosophically decide as a community how we're going to divide this pie. And that's really, you know, we, we've got we've to have those discussions with a group of seven people on the other side first. Because if, we're, if we can't convince them first, it doesn't, you know, the, 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 the community, we have to, we, ultimately they decide, but they're going to decide what the council puts in front of them, not what we put in front of them. Right. So to me, we've got to really work on, it, it's got to be across the board for sure, but, but focusing on that relationship and building that, that communication, I think it's a great idea, Jackie, to try and do a couple of just workshops. Well, one, one of the things that, I, that I'm going to suggest that we do, I just want you to think about it, we're not in a decision-making mode, is when we receive our copy of the budget, give it to somebody else to read, whether it's your spouse or your friend, or and just let them go through it and ask the questions, because those are the questions that are going to be asked, not only by the council, but by the public. And if we can answer those questions uh, right up front, as an addendum to the budget, if you will, perhaps we can have a smoother ride. I don't know. I've never done it, so. And I also think it's important that expectations are managed earlier. I feel very strongly that we were sort set up for failure right out of the gate. And I think the discussion with the council early on to, to help sh you know, show them and educate them on what is in our budget and the fact of Flatline, depending on who you talk to, flatline meant different things to different people. That meant zero percent to some people. It meant level services to others. So we need to get to them before they decide that they're going to throw out a number that we just can't live up to. Well, and I think that some of that education has started about the fact that there is a diff diff there's a separate governance board for the schools because it operates differently than all of the other departments of the town. I mean, in the last throes of discussion, it was still, why have the schools not done what we told them to do? And, mm -hmm. and so when, you, when, you, when you're when you posing that question in the 11th, way into the 11th hour, mm -hmm. there's a fundamental misunderstanding, um, and, and unfortunately, it creates a, an adversarial stance mm -hmm. because it's, it, it, the, the, the school is being viewed or the board is being viewed as not being compliant or mm -hmm. being or disregarding right. mm -hmm. the, the directions that are given when in fact the directions are given to the rest of the town 
and you all have the responsibility to identify the needs of the students and represent them and advocate for a reasonable accommodation of, of, of getting those resources. So. And in addition to that, it's not just um, I read internet comments. I think I've said that before. But I read comments after stories, and I've heard more than once, I've read more than once people saying, why do we even need a school board? I just want to get rid of us because they feel that we're so inept at our job and so un incapable of doing what the council says that the council should just abolish us. So there's that too. We need to correct and inform people and educate them that we need to be here and it's not just because we think so and that it's required. So it's and to that point though, I think that education starts at the seven person yes. level first. Because I think it's easier for us to have a meaningful discussion with seven individuals versus 18,000 individuals. Right. And if we get the other seven individuals to understand <laughs> the, the, the unforeseen, hopefully unrequested unrequ consequences of making offhand comments and having people say, you know what, look, this is a process. It's a difficult process, it's, and, but it's, a, it's structured for a reason. And it, it, as opposed to creating that adversarial approach, you know, try to get some form of common ground. And, and I've spoken to a couple of the counselors, and I think that's really what we have to start with, is what, where can we find some common ground to start with? But they don't ask the questions. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. And that's, that's ultimately the goal, is to say, look, okay, you know, we're, you know, look, we've had other, we've had several people say, we don't give answers and we're being opaque. Our, our, our process couldn't be more transparent. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for it to be more transparent. Everything's posted. Meetings are televised. You know, uh, we're all, all of our contact information is public information. So to have individuals infer that we're unavailable or we don't respond to questions or we're not giving answers or providing answers really isn't a realistic assessment. So. How do you stop that? How do you fix that? You fix that by sitting down ahead of time and saying, okay, look, let's, let's put the rhetoric aside. Let's look at the facts and the figures. Let's talk about the pie is only so big. We all understand that. How do we want to divide it and why? And that's, those are some of the, I think, basic philosophical discussions that we need to start having because once we have that discussion and once we get on the same page with that, then we can start looking at the details of how much is too much. You know, when do we when do we when do we go for more? When do we not? You know, what's what's the political mode? You know, you know because ultimately, we we fight separate battles all the time. We're being divided and conquered. We've got issues with the public to deal with. We've got issues with board people to deal with, and we've got issues in our own budget where we've got to decide collectively how do we want to divvy up the resources. Right. You know, so so I mean, I think I. I for sure, there's a lot of things that we, 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 we can work on. I think communication remains the key. I agree. And, and I think, uh, you know, working with, the, with, you know, doing what we, we, reaching out to the council as much as we can, I guess for lack of a better word. You can't force anybody to do anything, um, but you, you, you hope you, um, you know, I like to say, I'll set the table, I'll show you the menu, you have to decide if you want to sit down and eat or not. And I, I think that's what we need to do with the, with, with the, the council. I think from this year's experience, I, you know, I, you know, the first voting field, I kind of have a little bit different view. Is I think the well, what really decides our budget is the voters, it's, and uh, not really the town council. The town council let us have to confide the first time, and uh, so I think even though we're not a political uh, organization. We advocate for the kids. However, I really think we need to work with the voters. We need to reach out and we need to understand the psychology, the ideology behind the voters, and see how to work with the system. And the I can imagine next year it's not going to be much change. The people's, you know, I. Still, the income level probably not going to be changing for uh, fixed income people. And so the level of increase is going to be always going to be limited. So how are we going to put in a certain limit on ourselves and try to reach a increase more incremental uh, uh, catch-up or increase?
increase in our budget to do it in a way that's gradual and um, is easy for the voters to accept. I think you know, that's the, so if we know something's coming up, like for right now this year budget, we have to actually think back. We did throw, uh, throw down those surpluses, and next year we're using those as the operation, and next year it's going to come back and bite us. And so right, right there, in order not to something big increase next year, which I know, everybody knows, it's going to be difficult to pass. How are we going to work this year to keep our goal, keep our budget, keep our operation um, under certain limits or find a different ways to do it? Because otherwise, we are, you know, that we probably going to put ourselves in a very, very difficult situation next year. I, don't, I, I guess I don't, I don't uh, disagree with you, Jane. I think that they're really, we, obviously we need, to, we need to convince the voters that these are the right investments. But um, the other thing that I like to say is that um, heading now into my fourth year here in Scarborough, um, at the rate that we're incrementally moving things, um, it will take 12 years for me to move to where you were before um, 2000, 2009, 2010. So I don't know if, I, um, not being a very patient person, I don't, I don't think that that's fast enough. I think that that's, uh, you know, so I, I, would, I would prefer the, the, um, the approach of getting people to understand w how critically important making those investments are because, you know, we, we quote um, Kelly Murphy, you know, you just can't, you just don't get a second round at fourth grade. And, and in fourth grade, kids should be exposed to foreign language, for example. And in fifth grade, they should be exposed to foreign language. And quite frankly, they're not. And, and, and they're not going to be in the foreseeable future if we continue to move incrementally in the way that we've been moving these last, past three years. So, I mean, I, I think your point's a good one. The question really is, what, what is okay incrementally um, and is, finally getting a restoration of what was lost years ago um, over 12 years, is that, a, is, is that an appropriate sort of incremental adjustment? Okay. I, I don't know. I I, think I, I'm going to be a very old man by the time we start getting... Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I respond first. <laughs> if, if by the time we get resources in the right spots um, and in the, in the same places that um, many of those other high schools, for example, are, in uh, not just in the top 10, but in the top 25. I mean, we still have a ways to go there. Yes, um, but I, I normally have a saying, you know, I really, um, you know, believe in that it's much easier to change yourself than change somebody else. And <laughs> so I think there are things that in our control, there are things not in our control. And, um, you know, looking at, for example, looking at the student-teacher ratio, 15 to 1. I know we are one of the highest in the state. However, if you look at other states, if you look at the top thousand schools in the nation, the range is hugely different. Like, kids school up to 27 people to 1 in high school, they still rank top 200. But you, the thing that you don't know is what other resources do they have yeah. that support mm -hmm. those 27 kids, because it's not just the it's just not. It's not just the teacher, kid in the in the classroom. It's all of the other resources that support that group of kids. In, I know in California and Oregon, you know, there's the, the say very, you know, like it's not just California, very big. Uh, just like Oregon, it's very similar in um, you know political background and other things with us. And they have average about 17 to 18 um, kids per, per uh, teacher ratio. And I look at those uh, um, schools, you know, the districts, the people spending, very much similar to what we have in Maine. So that that is, I think, it's important. The, actually, the teacher um, pays similar we are that too. So it's it's if we can. You know, get the quality teachers, pay them higher, and we have higher ratio, and we can offer more classes. 
that it can be alternative to, you know, having no ratios and having average teachers and having less classes. <coughs> so that's something I just think it's working with what we have, what we can control is so much easier to, you know, work with people who, you know, that's, you just see, it's like, um, you know, Middle East, is hundreds of years, you know, people are different. If you want to change others and, you know, make them everything used the way you want, it's going to be a battle okay. every time. So how do we make it better, you know? That's, that's just my point. Sorry. I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the purpose of this meeting is a goal setting. And, and I think it's, you know, just having the hearing these conversations we're having, it's, it's kind of clear that I think we all have ideas of where we want to be, whether it's student-teacher ratio, whether it's, you know, uh, per pupil funding or something, I think it's important for us when we do our, when we sit down to establish our goals, to, to pick some targets mm. and, and to say, look, if we want to be, do we want to be state average funding? And if we do, do we want to do it in three years or five years or seven years? And, and, and I think we start with that. That doesn't mean it's cast in concrete and we lock solid our for it, but I think we start with that where do we want to be discussion. Then I think we can go to the council and say, look, work with us. Here's our goal. If it's a realistic goal and you agree that it's a good goal, help us get there. How do we get there together? But we have to establish where we want the end line to be first and, and how we're going to measure that. Mm -hmm. so, so whether it's, I think we, we need to think about it and decide, is it going to be, you know, student-teacher ratio? Is it going to be, I mean, personally for me, I'd love to see the average pupil funding. I'd love to be able to hit that number because then we can determine whether we want to invest that in, in, in people or in programs or in technology, or we can determine how that resource is going to be utilized. <coughs> so for me, I, I would prefer to say, look, I, my goal for our, our district would be to get to the average state funding. I don't need to be top two. I don't need to be top five. I just want to be average. I don't think that's unrealistic. And I think that's an easy, I, I think that's a tenable position that we could, we could present to the council and say, okay, if you agree that this is a good thing, help us get there. Well, how do we do it? I think this discussion was needed and I think it's been very productive. Yeah. And, I, and I, there is opportunity. What, what is the date, Kelly, that we have the um, I was looking at Kelly Johnston, the, the retreat for the board. 14th. Okay. August 14th. Mm -hmm. August 14th. 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 Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. I think, changed maybe. But. And, um, and it, it looks as though we're going to try to get back to SMCC. So there will be plenty of time to, to um, set these goals. Um, and, uh, you know, I know, for example, the Long Range Facilities um, Planning Group uh, and, and Jane can, can speak to it, um, really, there's a lot of data there. There's a lot of, of stuff to, to sink our, our teeth into, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we're going to have to start uh, looking at that and, and determining what direction we're going and answering the question about the middle school and mm -hmm. the use of, you know, Wentworth space and what are we doing with the K-2s. And we are moving in that direction, definitely. Mm -hmm. It's a... It's, um, Good, good data, and you yeah. can, if you can think of a scenario, we can run the scenario and tell you how much it's going to cost and at what point in time it will return on the investment that you make. And mm -hmm. We haven't got there yet, but we will. It's getting there. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, we did this. Uh, it, it's really funny because people, uh, I've heard people say, well, they've never done any long-range planning. Well, that's baloney because when... Uh, Bob Mitchell and David Benneman were first on the board. Uh, we spent one entire summer with uh, PDT at that time. We didn't even have Harriman. We had Portland Design Team mm -hmm. and, and came up with uh, $60 million as the need to, for the high school and the middle school in Wentworth. That was several years ago, but for then, you know, and then when when we got to high school and we said we wanted to do Wentworth, we said, wait a minute, we told you it was going to be $60 million, mm -hmm. and it came in $62 million. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty close. Mm -hmm. they didn't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's that, that is what becomes frustrating for me is you do what you think is right, mm -hmm. And then the ones who can control whether it goes to the voters are say, no, we don't want to hear it. I sometimes think it's hard to <coughs> adjust what we're doing to 
um, meet expectations in the public. It would be just for example, um, I was listening to NPR the other day, they're talking about the evolution of achievement tests and SATs and how they got to be where they are. And they were talking about how not that long ago, to get into college, you had to have had Greek and Latin and several sciences and um, not that long ago, even less time, when I was in school in Scarborough, in sixth grade, we were exposed to Arabic and Chinese and Japanese and Russian um, in this town. And granted, I think that was mostly by um, residents that volunteered their time to come in, but it's been in town. We've had kids being exposed to foreign language, not that they need to be fluent in sixth grade, but have exposure to it. So when people say it's good enough or it's a waste of time, you know, they don't need it, what's wrong with the old way? Well, that was the old way. So I think it's hard. It's a moving target. Whoever is complaining, we can't adjust the budget to meet their needs. We have to go forward with a budget and guiding the school department in a way that makes sense for kids and that's going to be the best education for the kids in schools right now, this day, not 50 years ago, not 50 years from now, but um, all we can do is keep doing what we're doing and try to educate people about why and why it's important. So I have a hard time with, I understand what voters are telling us, what people are telling us, but they don't have all the information we have, so it's our job to give it to them yes. and go from there because we can't, we can't bend to the whim. And I'd also like to point out it's impossible to condense six months' worth of meeting right. into two days, days before a vote right. and, and expect people to get everything and understand yeah. all the decisions that were made up to that point. Right. So. I, I think it's more, too, about voter apathy. That's a big part and, of it as well. And, and I'm not sure. Maybe we need to borrow some of the strategies of different political parties are using in order to get the vote out. Well, I think it's... it's what it's beginning to feel like. There's no, there's no one size fits all for this. We've got a lot of work to do on a lot of areas. You know, I mean, we've got, it, but it, it, I think again, the, it boils down to communication on multiple fronts, um, and that's what we've got to work on. And that's, I think, that's where we focus our goal setting on. Is, is that continues to be the, the challenge that we have, whether it's with the board of the town or voters or whatever. I mean, that's really. Well, that, well that's goal six. So we yeah. sort of jumped ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I agree you know, communication, everyone's communication is really, really important. However, it's never a bad thing to find better ways to do things mm -hmm. and better ways to educate. So I think always make that one of the goals is important. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, all we do is we stay with what we're doing and we just educate and communicate. I think there are more to that. There, there are both ways it has to be worked. Work. So let's go to goal four. Um, delegate to the superintendent the day-to-day -day administration of the school district, including discipline and all personnel matters. And the target there is to continue to govern consistent with this delegation and adopt policy to support the superintendent's day-to-day -day management of the district. I think we've been doing that. that happens. Mm -hmm. I would say that is ongoing. Good job, everyone. Goal five, evaluate the board's own leadership, governance, and teamwork for children. Targets, uh, advocacy, <laughs> represent the needs and interests of every student and advocate for adequate and appropriate resources to meet these needs. Board development, continue to engage in regular self-assessment and invest in development using diverse approaches that address the needs of the board as a whole as well as those of individual board members. Establish a stronger focus on new school board member development and uh, also planning and setting goals, use strategic planning to set educational goals and determine the means for accomplishing them. Mm -hmm. I think we're doing all right on those advocacy. I think we've, short of quitting all our jobs and disowning our families, been pretty strong advocates <laughs> for the kids in this town. So. I, I, I won't speak for you guys, being the two newest board members, but I know when I was onboarded, there wasn't much of an onboarding process. I'd like to see us do a little bit better job onboarding people, whether it's providing a package of materials to bring them up to speed, whether it's Marzano and a Drummond Woodson book or something, but a little bit more of a formal process. I, I think we ought to work on that a little bit more because we're doing a lot of OJT, and, and I think that sometimes can be a little, a little overwhelming. So it would be nice to have a little bit more of a formal 
approach to mm -hmm. new board training. That, 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 yeah, not speaking for you guys. And I also think um, not maybe a formal mentorship or something like that, but someone you know you can that you're sort of assigned to that you can call and be like, what are we talking about here? What does this all mean? Mm -hmm. And and give me the 411 on it, mm -hmm. um, just to sort of get you up to speed those yeah. first few months. I mean, yeah, you don't know going <laughs> in to the budget cycle what the budget cycle is going to involve. Hmm. I remember just saying to Kelly at the beginning, this is, I feel good, I'm confident, it's great. <laughs> and she's like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Why are you so negative about it? <laughs> it's rather deliberate that yeah. you don't know right. what the cycle is. It's, it's harder to get flip. candidates when you know all the facts. <laughs> <laughs> Do what I tell you to do, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> that got me through. <laughs> well, you know, it's, when um, Christine and I came on the board, we were fortunate in that we were, um, for a lot of reasons, we were unopposed when we got on the board. And because of that, we knew that we were de facto going to be on the board, so we were able to go to the um, state convention in October. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of boardsmanship stuff. So yeah. it's actually unfortunate the timing of that. I don't know why it's in October when people generally have their elections in November because there's a lot of good information um, that comes out of that. So uh, I don't know if we can change the right. whole state. Probably not. But You have to wait a whole year to actually go yeah. to it. Yeah. So yeah. But remember, so there are a lot of boards who are elected in June. True, true. Uh -huh. Well, just no, around us. Yeah. 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 Falmouth and Cape Eight. Elizabeth. I think of June elections. Mm -hmm. They 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 go with the June primary. Well, I but even if, if if it stays the same, you've got to file your paperwork the first week in September. So, mm -hmm. if we knew a person was, you know, in a situation with it unopposed, then maybe we ought to just bring them along. You know? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you if you can only go if you're sworn in as a board member. I mean, or the public can go. I mean. Yeah, I think I think. If yeah, it was an unopposed position. It, you know, I think it um, is unlikely that would be a repeat yeah. situation this year. But I also think you got to be careful that you know, I mean, because if, if you do have contended races, you know, oh, right. you're gonna yeah, you're gonna absolutely. have somebody come in un necessarily unprepared. That you know, you, you know what I'm saying. I, I think it would be nice to have something that's a little more for maybe we do look at changing the cycle. Yeah. I don't know if it's a charter issue or if it's... If well, it's when I was first on, on the board, uh, the election for a school board and council was in December. Hmm. It was in December, and then you were seated in January. Hmm. And they... But I you can't tell you the year that they changed the charter to have it coincide with the November elections, which makes much more sense. For for the for maybe for the council, but in terms of the ac regular academic school year starting in September, it would make sense for us to get new to board members in June. In June yeah. Because September we've got a whole new I mean these guys are coming in A in the middle of an academic year, and we all do in the middle of an academic year, and then B you jump right into a budget fight which is very complex and convoluted and you know so I, I I'm not going there. Well could the no, 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 the vote, you, no, could the, the possibility. I mean could the vote be attached to the uh, school budget? You coming to vote on the well, budget? You're I don't think they'd elect right anybody now. if it was attached to the school budget. <laughs> 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 uh, well the primary is no, held in June every year, right? It's not a separate I mean, vote. Yeah. But the primaries are held every year in June, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if we if yeah. we did have, if we, I mean, maybe we, that's something I think would be worth looking into. At least maybe yeah. it's not possible. I don't know. But I mean, well, to me, it would make a lot of sense. Charter charter change. Change. I, I know, but they've changed it obviously in the past right. to go from yeah. November, yeah. December to November. Yeah. Right. So if we, I mean, if it doesn't affect the council and it's just us and we request a charter change and it's legal, why, why wouldn't they accommodate us? Don't know. Right. What's that? There's a reason. Lord, if we ask, they, they might say yes. <laughs> if I was going to say something negative at yeah. all. Well, so uh, because those other towns did just change recently. They, right. they just changed recently. But keep in mind also that there are many school board people who are elected at town meeting. Yeah. So it's, it's by not consistent throughout no, the state. No, no, no. Not, not by any means. Okay, so goal six we talked about a lot um, already. Develop consistent with the approach of leadership council community-wide communication strategy. 
continue to develop and implement a comprehensive school board communication strategy with the various school and community constituencies. Continue to solicit and encourage many forms of parent and community participation in the school system. I know there's always work and we can always do a better job or do more, but I think we've been working on this one pretty hard all year. Yep. Just one, one example. Um, when, when I heard you say uh, encourage parents and community participation <coughs> in the school system, um, Pleasant Hill, our smallest little elementary K-2 school, did a calculation of the volunteer hours that they have. And the volunteer hours, when they added them up and divided them by the school day, ended up being 140, I think it was 142 school days worth of volunteer effort in that school. I believe it. So you can imagine what it is across the district. Mm -hmm. I believe it. It's, I mean, without the equivalent volunteers, of 142 we'd be sunk. Full, full days of work that people have invested. I, th I think the easiest way to pass the budget is to put the voting booths at each of the K-2 schools. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, we've worked really hard this year with the um, going and meeting with groups. Don't yes. have a group. job, I think. Well, I, yeah, okay. Yeah. We've done a we've done a good job with that. We have our official Facebook page now. We can get correct information to people. Um, I think district leaders have done a good job with press releases. I mean, I think we're doing I think we're doing a good job with this one. It's always like I said, people think that we're not giving enough information. Our meetings are always in public. You can tell by the crowd here; they're not attended. Um, it's Such not for lack of there. trying. <laughs> not for lack of trying. We do want people to know and to be engaged, so we'll keep beating that horse, I guess, until... Well, I'll tell you, this, this is the best board I have ever worked with, collectively. I mean, we don't always just always agree, but when we disagree, it is constructive. It is easy to work with everybody on the board. Uh, we have the same aim. We all want what's best for our children without any personal vendettas. Or <laughs> it's just been pleasant for me that way. It truly, truly is. Okay. So we also want to review this meeting schedule, or is that just for information? Um, that's just for your information. We, we uh, change the things uh, that we needed to change. Uh, I cleaned it up. So do take a look at it. If there's any conflicts, you can let us know. Not personal conflicts. <laughs> conflicts in general. Right. Okay. All right. So now we have scheduled to go into executive session. So I guess I will make the motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA section 4056A to discuss the superintendent evaluation for 20. 13, 14, and not return to public session. Second. All in favor? Six. Okay, we are adjourned to executive session. Thank you, Mr. Creech. Thank you, David. Thank you.